turbidite sandstones, the deposits from submarine particulate gravity flows, huge subaqueous sediment avalanches. I'm a structural geologist interested in the tectonics of sedimentary basins and the sedimentology of turbidites provides great information for understanding basins. I'm visiting some classic localities in the Anot turbidite system on the edge of the Alps in southeast France. It includes very thick sandstone formations, rocks that you perhaps not think of straight away of having been deposited in deep marine settings. But burrow structures like this on bedding planes give the game away. These rocks deposited many hundreds of metres below sea level. This is the first of two videos on the Anot system. In this first one, we'll visit a few classic localities around its type area, places much visited by professional geologists wanting to see strata that otherwise would lie far offshore or deeply buried in the subsurface. In the second video, we'll take our understanding from the type area and try and trace the continuity of the Anot sandstone further down system into the high ground of the Western Alps. But for now, let's stay in Provence. So, where are we? We're in the Western Alps and the Anat sandstone is preserved in a series of pretty large outcrop patches. They include classic turbidites, which inspired the pioneering ideas of Arnold Baumer in the 1960s, which in turn developed understanding of submarine fans and the variations in sedimentary structures through sandstone beds, so-called Baumer cycles. But Baumer's ideas were based on the notion that a turbidity current simply decelerates and wanes its capacity to carry sediment simply declining through time. Sedimentary rocks, the deposits, sample this behaviour at a point on the seabed. And as the flow wanes, it deposits progressively finer sediment, leaving behind a simply graded bed that finds upwards. This behaviour is expected only really where submarine fans can build out unimpeded across the seabed. But that isn't the situation for the Anot. Like almost all turbidite successions exposed and preserved in the geological record, the causative flows couldn't just spread out in an uninhibited fashion, they were confined along structures that had deformed the seabed. In these situations, a stratified flow means that coarse grains will deposit preferentially along the bottom and the fines on the flank of the conduit. And by keeping the flow confined, it can run out over a vast distance without significant deceleration. So the coarser sand is fractionated all the way along the conduit over a long distance. But grain size fractionates over very short distances when considered in a direction lateral to the flow. All of which means that turbidites in the geological record are fantastic recorders of ancient active tectonic structures that influence the form of the seabed. And because the flows went downhill, they seek bathymetric lows, turbidite systems are great for reconstructing large scale basin structures. For the last several decades, this has been the conceptual understanding of the Anot system. Submarine sands deposited in narrow, structurally controlled conduits. And the sand originates in the south, eroded from basement rocks exposed along the modern Mediterranean coast, and from Corsica, which at that time lay directly offshore mainland France. And that time was the latest Eocene, earliest Oligocene so some 40 to 35 million years ago. The Anot sandstones are actually part of a mega sequence that starts with a shallow water limestone deposited across an older sub-aerial land surface 
underlain in turn, in Provence at least, by late Cretaceous limestones. They pass upwards into progressively deeper water strata, carbonate muds, the so-called blue marls, before they get swamped by siliciclastic turbidites, the Anot sandstone. Locally within this succession, there are brown siltstones and carbonate mudstones called the brown marls. More about these later. So that's a general introduction to the strata. Let's go and visit them, starting in their type area around the town of Anot. Let's start by looking below the sandstones and we can build up the succession. Cretaceous limestones, unconformably overlain by the Eocene Neolithic limestones, overlain in turn, largely hidden by the ridge, by the Blue Marls, and then the turbidites. But there's a fault across this view, across which the Blue Marls thicken dramatically. Let's step back. This is just a part of the change in thickness of the Blue Marls. It's actually hundreds of metres difference. Here's the fault, and it's sealed by the turbidites. So the fault was active during these depositional episodes. And we can trace the sandstones back and visit them over on that road section. The thin turbidite sandstones are interbedded with siltstones, but follow the sands to the left and they thin and pinch out, like this. And so do the thicker beds too. It looks like on lap, the strata deposited along the flank of a structural conduit. But how does this work? Well, the sandy parts would deposit lower on the slope and the silts coming from the tail and cloud of the turbidity current lie across the top and drape up the slope. Each sand layer banks or tapers against the slope. It looks like onlap with the onlap surface, the sequence boundary, apparently here, but actually the onlap surface is here. These pinch outs reflect the fractionation of sand, not the edge of each depositional episode. And the different depositional patterns control the geometry of the final deposit. So that's a bit of detail of the stratal geometry along the flank of a conduit of a confined flow. But critically, the sands show evidence of bypass. Much of their causative flows carried on down the conduit. Remember, a simply waning flow should leave a deposit that simply grades out. But not these beds. Abrupt tops formed like this. Flow decelerates enough to drop out the coarse grains, but keeps going, carrying the rest of the sediment load with it. This is called flow stripping, and it's diagnostic of the rest of the flow bypassing this area, continuing on down the system. Rather than beds that grade out, as in a Bauma cycle, no, these have abrupt tops, distinct grain size breaks. And that's what we see in outcrop all along this road section. But this road section doesn't just hold these simple interbedded sandstones and siltstones that we've just been interpreting. Some parts show much greater complexity. Layers that contain large dismembered sand balls encased in rather soupy looking muds and silts, along with rather curious sandwich beds. These can be interpreted as deformed substrates, that's slightly older turbidites deposited by just earlier flows. The next flow runs over the slope, remobilizing the substrate, entrained with sand from this flow. And all this mess can then creep off down the slope leaving locally sourced debrites. And there are also beds like this, 
sandstones containing thin layers of silty debrite, along with the odd siltstone clast. These so-called hybrid beds have seen a lot of sedimentary research in the past decade or so, and they occur preferentially here on this old paleoslope. So mixed deposits and entrainment of local substrate into the deposit left by turbidity currents. So much then for these old slope deposits from the Bro Road section. Our next stop is across the valley and the classic outcrops of Anot Sandstone directly above the eponymous village. We're off to a famous site, the Chambre du Roi, the King's Bedroom. It lies up in the cliffs, which are formed of amalgamated sandstone beds. These deep crevasses are formed by pinnacles of sandstone that are frozen in the act of being spalled off down the hillside, which at least provides some shade rather than the scorching sun on the Bro Road section. So I've walked up above the village of Anot to look at this type section of the Grey Danot, the Anot sandstone. Some really great structures in here. They're sedimentary structures and they tell of bypass. Out along this ledge, we can access some of the sandstones for a closer look. So these are big, thick packages, what, two meters thick? as a bed unit of more or less the same grain size with lots of dewatering dishes within it. Fantastic sandstones. These deposits are classic examples of the sand fairway the accumulated streaks of sediment deposited along the main axis of the structural conduit. And it's not just sand, they're gravels too. And irregular scour surfaces. So lots of erosion and carried bed load. Virtually no fine sand. These fasces are evidence of extensive bypass. Presumably thousands of turbidity currents pass through this area, leaving gravels, some eroding into the substrate, or carrying almost all the sand and fines further away down system. So this is what the base of a structurally controlled system looks like, the main conduit. So much for the fasces. What about the place of these outcrops in the local basin? These amalgamated sandstones and gravels lie west of Bro, slightly younger, but with respect to Bro, further up the old Paleo slope. We can show this by redrafting the profile. This is a bit of a puzzle, but actually it tells us about structural evolution. So we've been looking at the outer flank of a syncline. In profile, like this, hard to see, so on the right I vertically stretch things. One way of shifting the fairway is to elevate the right hand side so that the former flank becomes the structural low and the amalgamated sands and fairway fasces can step back across the former flanking deposits. One way this can happen is if the fold axes migrate through time like this. So tracking the evolution of flanking fasces and sand fairways is a great tool for deducing structural evolution. So let's get back to the rocks and the sand fairway 
up at the Chambre du Roi. So lots of sediment has flushed through the system here, heading down system. That's broadly in a northward direction. Well, let's move further north along the Grey Danot system and see what the deposits look like up there. So we're moving north away from Anot to a place called Chaloufi. It's a mountainside outcrop, that seismic scale. And it reveals the lateral tapering out again of sands against what must have been the flank to these major sand conduits in the Anot system. Right, well let's, let's get sketching. The hillside I'm sketching is almost one kilometre across, viewed slightly obliquely and about 250 metres high. The lower slopes are blue miles, forming that gullied hillside with some grassy ridges. The hilltop emerging from the woodland contains a series of low cliffs, turbidite sandstones. Follow these across and they taper to the right, abutting the blue miles. So this is my sketch. It shows on lap. So we can go on a bit of a tour around this landscape and have a look at these layers and we'll start at the top. Below the sandstone cliff are brown, thin bedded, presumably thinner turbidites. Okay, there's some small faults too, offsetting the whiter sandstones on top. Probably this is just toppling in the modern landscape. But the base of this sandstone package shows broad shallow scour features, a few tens of metres across. Let's look further along. And here, the basal sand bed cuts up and down on quite short distances into the thin bedded substrate, so erosion at the base of this sandstone package. We can trace the thin bedded units, that brown material, and we can see that they're oblique to the unconformity onto the blue marl. That's on lap, simplified in a cartoon like this. So let's jump now to the lowest sandstone cliff. We're looking really obliquely here, but we can still see it has well-defined bedding that appears to terminate directly against the blue marl. So lots of on lap directly against the substrate. There's not much sign of the marginal slope deposits that we saw on the Bro Road earlier on on our tour. So these are quite interesting observations here at Shallow Fee. They suggest perhaps rather little deposition higher on the paleo slope and perhaps it was too steep. And we can get an idea of this from the next sandstone cliff further up. And there's a large recumbent fold gaping to the left Follow the beds around and they truncate upwards into a thick, unstructured sand body. Now let's follow this sandstone cliff further along and there's more dismembered folding, truncated at the top. The very top of this cliff section is fairly flat and the beds across go, well they go right across, so presumably there was erosion of the slumped and dismembered sandstone package below, 
before the deposition of the top units. This slumping presumably was down the onlap surface, beds rolling down slope and disintegrating as they go. Maybe this was due to tectonic tilting, though it would have had to be pretty dramatic and broadly synchronous with deposition. So these slumping triggers need more work. So overall, deposition of turbidites up against a paleo slope. So these are the outcrop sketches that capture the critical geometries. Well, that's some pretty spectacular lateral pinch out on that relationships. Really neat. Okay, let's get off the hill. We've been looking onto the edge of one of the conduits which channelized the turbidity currents that carried sand northwards away from Corsica. And we tracked this sound north from Anot here to Shallow Fee. These are classic localities for turbidite sedimentology, very famous and much visited. But what happens further down system? Where does it end? Well, that bit of detective work is for the second part of this video.